This is uh, kind of our second uh, presentation that we're doing. We're running through some uh, different topics on online learning, but this could uh, obviously apply to blended or face-to-face -face learning as well in lots of different ways. So don't necessarily think that you have to only do online to do this. Uh, we're kind of looking at these as we're going to do one session on looking at the basics of instructional design, kind of reimagining them and uh, questioning them, and then looking at a session on an advanced topic such as this one. Now, a lot of those distinctions are kind of different for different people. This may be an advanced topic for you, and it may not. Uh, we, I just kind of pick those terms randomly, not randomly, but just as a way to help classify a little bit, but you don't necessarily have to look at this as advanced, or you don't have to look at the basic ones as basic either. This is just uh, some way to maybe uh, give uh, a general starting off point, and then you can agree with this group if you want. So, and like Ann said, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to, um, Raise your hand, ask me if you want to contribute anything. There'll be some questions as I go along where I will want you to contribute something, but feel free at any other moment to do that as well. Because um, I'm sure some of you have experimented with or even taught with some of these concepts as well. So hopefully we can uh, pull on your experience as well to give us some feedback. Um, a quick little bit about myself. I have met some of you, but not all of you. Uh, I've worked at UTA for 14 or 15 years. Most of that in the center for uh, distance education as an instructional designer. And then uh, about five years ago, I moved over here as a researcher uh, to research uh, future technologies, learning innovation, things like that. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley. I have to get that straight, it needs to be uh, UT Brownsville. Um, I teach in their master's degree program online uh, and instructional design. So that's just a little bit about myself. So I do teach, I just don't talk about teaching, I actually do teach as well. So. I can make people know that, but a lot of people know that, but I do teach as well, so. Um, so, uh, creating nonlinear content structure with gaming tools. So, um, I pulled up some examples of some of the things that I've done. So I'm gonna leave real fast. When I'm talking about nonlinear concepts, anybody recognize this book up here? Anyone read those as a kid? Yeah, I read those as a kid, I loved those as a kid. I, I, was, I was also the kid that kept my fingers in like five different places. Yeah. So if I didn't like the way that the story went, I could then go back. I was gaming the game itself. So, um, uh, so this will form kind of a, a framework for what those look like. And so, first one is an example. This is a story called Spaceship Landed in My Backyard. It's actually a story my son started telling me when he was in second grade. Uh, he's about to go fourth grade, so this you know very very recent. And I started to make this this into a story about basically uh, you're having a normal day just like any other day, or so you think, and suddenly a spaceship lands in your backyard. This is the story that he was telling it to me. And so the idea is you click through these links until you come to a decision point and says, don't just stand there and gawk, what do you do? Run away or go look? So who wants to go run away or go look? Anyone can yell it out. Go look, go look. Go look. good. <laughs> so y'all are thinking like my son does. You can tell which ones I added in there because I was trying to be the responsible adult and the one that he. <laughs> so spaceships are cool as you approach, the door opens, and stormtroopers come out. Realize this is coming from the mind of a, a second grader. Uh, so, do you go with the stormtroopers or do you run away? Go with the stormtroopers, very good. Because again, you've got to think like this about, about the way a second year, a two year old, uh, second grader would. Let's say, go, no, go with them. You walk into the ship, the uh, ship jumps into hyperspace, uh, you're heading for a planet. Uh, this is a planet from Star Wars, and oh no, you're about to be in this battle from Star Wars. The battle Genosis for those, he had obviously just seen this. Star Wars or something. So what do you do? Look for a escape pod or just play it cool and see what happens? Play cool. Play cool and see what happens. All right. You decide to stay in the back of the room. One of them seems to notice you and starts walking towards you. What do you do? Continue to play cool or go find an escape pod? Play cool. Play cool. Play cool. <laughs> All right. The stormtrooper edges closer. He says, you need to come with me. You seem out of place. What do you do? Go with him or bolt and find a way out? Go with him, very good, all right. There's no wrong answers here, are you? you, you know, I know, I, none of these options kill you like they would in choose your own adventure books, okay? Just the, this is my, my second, you know, second grade to remember. Uh, you get a strange feeling you should follow the stormtrooper. He takes you down a hall where no one else can see you. He pulls off his helmet. 
it's Luke Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to get all the Earth things that the Empire legally took off the planet back to Earth. Here's an escape pod, may the force be with you, and you escape. You go out to head back home, and your escape pod lands in your backyard just in time for dinner. You have been saved. So you can obviously see the mind of a, of a second grader in there. There are other options in there where you don't get to meet Luke, or if you don't, you know, choose to go with the stormtrooper, you just, you know, wake up mysteriously in your backyard and other options like that. This was built in the tour we're going to look at today called Twine, and we'll go into the specifics of that in a little bit. Uh, some other uses for Twine, I did this for a presentation on this topic this year at the OLC Innovates. Uh, I use this in place of PowerPoint, this is still the same Twine tool, where I asked my audience if they wanted you know, I was talking on this topic that I do research on, self-map learning pathways, and then do, I asked them, what are they? Do you want me to answer? Do you want to answer? Do you ask the uh, map bot? If they say they want me to answer, I say, not so fast. You don't get off that easy. I want you to answer. You go to the ask the map bot. Uh, you know, we built a little chat bot here. The chat bot says, I'm not going to answer either. And basically, they get into a loop until they actually try to answer it themselves. There's some code in there that sends them on this loop that no matter what they do, they can't get out of the loop until they actually try to answer it themselves, right? And then once they've done that, they can come back and ask me, I'll say, okay, here's the chart for what self that point that place look like. And I'll actually talk about that at the end of the presentation as well. Jess and I have researched that. We can talk about that actual concept there. But um, so this shows you how there's some coding and options that you can put into Twine to put in some different things other than just branching trees because uh, Otherwise, branching trees are cool, but you can also do that in anything like WordPress or Canvas or other places like that. Um, and another place we've used this is in some of our MOOCs that we've offered online. We put a help center in there. If the student runs into some kind of help with something, they come in here and we offer them just a series of uh, either or questions. Do you have a question about the course itself or our program, which is the topic? The question of the course itself, and they say they have a course structure question, and they give these options about how much does it cost, and other things like that. Um, so this is another option you have for some of these nonlinear pathways is helping students answer questions, either about your topic or about the uh, course itself. And we also put a uh, chatbot in this one as well. So you can come to the chatbot and say, what is R? Oh, I did horribly. If the chatbot is working, Chatbot didn't like what I put in it. But anyway, the chatbot usually answers with a question. I think the chatbot's in a cranky mood right now. Uh, let's see. Let's pass this chatbot. What is game? Uh, so I answer back what the game theory is. I know my cat's longer on. So these chatbots are also something we'll talk about a little bit later to where you can also build something that will give them something that's a little more interactive, a little less linear, get some uh, ask their own questions in there. So if I told them that's funny, I spelled it correctly. Use <laughs> package. So and some of this was stuff that the, the service that we used uh, prepackaged with that you could, you know, tell, ask for a joke, say, tell me a joke. Life is all about perspective. The sinking of the Titanic was a miracle to the lobsters in the ship's kitchen. <laughs> Bad joke. Oh, so just give me another joke. So you see there's some limitations there. But anyway, this is just an example of another nonlinear process that you can put into your courses. So, so it says map bot in there. Mm -hmm. Is that you responding or that's the bot? Yeah. I, I was presenting at this conference, so I made a bot based on how I might answer. You could call it whatever you wanted to. Oh, so you're the one who made that joke. Yeah. Ah. Well, I didn't make the jokes up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like a joke I would make, but um, no, that was, they, they had some jokes pre-programmed in there to the bot that I got, and then I added some more of my content next oh, to it, cool. sorry, okay. yeah. They had some conversational stuff in there, you can put, uh, thank you. And it says, just doing my job, you know, those, those come pre-programmed with it, right? Uh, so there's some conversational things that students just decide by having this talk with the robot for whatever reason, uh, it'll respond back to them in some ways. Got it. That's a good question. 
Let's see. So we're going to put this uh, presentation up uh, on the page about this uh, this PowerPoint up on this page about the presentation, so you can get all these links out of that as well. So when people talk games, they say words like game-based learning, uh, learning games, gamification, game theory, those kind of things. A lot of people will use those interchangeably and swap them out. They actually do have some subtle differences on what they actually mean. Uh, game-based learning is the use of games in education to enhance learning. You take a pre-existing game like Minecraft, put it in your class, tell your students how to do something and learn something with it. That's game-based learning. Uh, learning games, those games are specifically designed uh, for educational purposes, your typing tutor games, your math games, those kind of things. Uh, gamification is where we're going to be kind of looking at today. This is adding game-like elements to uh, non-game context, such as uh, education. Um, and even places where you have like your reward systems at your restaurants, uh, those are also gamification, where you get so many uh, visits and you get a free burger on your next visit, those kind of apps they put on the phone, those are also considered parts of gamification because they're rewarding people for playing the game of eating at their restaurant. Uh, there's also this whole area of game theory, which will inform uh, what we're talking about today, but we're not gonna go into it very much, but it's basically the science of logical decision-making between humans, animals, and computers. Although I haven't seen many people put animals in front of a game, but uh, maybe someone is out there. So, I've been talking about some of the ideas and basics. All of you obviously looked at this uh, presentation topic and thought, this could do something with my class. So, I was hoping to get a time where some of you could share uh, why I kind of, I guess why you're here, or what some of your ideas that brought you here to this session were. I'm interested in non one size fits all because um, so I teach elementary literacy and one topic is phonics, which sounds ridiculous, but depending on what generation you're from, you may or may not have learned phonics as a child. So I'm a child of the 70s, so I did. Child, children of the 80s did not. So they don't have the, be they never learned it. So I need to differentiate What's people who don't know the sound of a vowel to people who are like, know, know it all. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So taking kind of a crusty subject in mm -hmm. my case, and then making it fun. So if people of different age could get something that's yeah, more yeah. Fun or different no, background yeah. knowledge. Yeah. yeah. So taking that hard subject. Just from what I've seen here, um, I think because I'm in the school of social work, I think that this would be something great to use for um, examples of what we could do um, with the, with when you're faced with this particular, so like an ethics perspective oh, kind of yeah. thing. Um, I know it's just gamification. <laughs> you can engage in ethics. It doesn't have to be yeah. so serious. <laughs> but that's, that's just kind of what I was thinking about, because I like to do things differently, too, and have a lot of hands-on learning um, type things. And, and I think, too, in the classroom, uh, that you can do that, too. You can do that with cell phones or any other Thing that they bring to the classroom. Okay. Good. What else? But I think similar to Peggy, the background knowledge of the students coming into my class is, is massively different. So I in the TESOL, linguistics and TESOL, and I have some students who taught overseas for five years, taught English overseas for five years, and then decided to come back and get a master's. And in the same class, I might have an undergraduate student who's actually never even talked, hopefully they've talked, but never even really interacted extensively with a second language learner of English. And they're all in the same classroom and I, I need to be able to meet the needs of both. So I, I'm hoping <laughs> that something like this can help where students who need a little more background knowledge can go one direction and students who are ready to move forward can skip the basics and jump ahead. Oh, okay, yeah. We've been using uh, playing cards and dice to demonstrate things in probability theory, but I'm thinking there's a lot more that I could do to uh, get research concepts across. It's good, and they're actually, uh, you can do some fairly advanced uh, programming in Twine and, uh, and introduce random variables and dice rolls and those kind of things in there as well. 
some people build full games in Twine that you know it's just like you're playing a you know a fancier uh, video game. Is it available to us through UTA? Or? It's free. It's a free. Oh, well, not that many. It's a free open source program. Yeah. Jill Reed, the library, kind of mentioned that too. That uh, she used it in the past. The game was designed by students as part of a service learning course and intended for first year uh, experience students. She has one. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, we'll have a link to some uh, student work as well in this, having your students work in this as well. And we have uh, a few people online, so Justin's going to. Uh, Throw in their comments. Yeah. Uh, if people put links, we'll, we'll drop it into the uh, web page. Yeah. Um, some resources from the talk. So I kind of have a different reason. So we talk about gamification mm -hmm. in a lot of my courses, and we talk about it as a way to train employees. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of hoping that this might be something that I can use as an activity to teach students how to do this ah, as they okay. move forward yes, mm -hmm. to train employees. You want them to make that. Yeah. That's great. Uh, there is uh, someone who's been trying to work on a way to integrate Twine itself into campus. You can't just plop Twine in there, they can do it, but they're trying to find a way that they could actually create something in Twine and then it would submit as an assignment, basically. There are ways to do that, but I just want to make it seamless. So we'll cover that in a minute, too, as well. So these are all great. All right. Let's see. Um, oh yeah. Before we jump into Twine, I didn't want to go into the whole these whole concepts of personalized and customized learning. You see these terms thrown around a lot to the point that they become overused buzzwords. Um, and what we're talking about here will often be referred to as personalized, but again, it's like that choose your own adventure book uh, to where all the pathways were predefined, right? There are ways you can introduce some uh, open-ended concepts to this that basically just you know, you come to one uh, node in Twine and say, here's an open-ended question, you go out and do this now. Um, but I just want you to realize that this, um, a lot of people will lump this in with the concept of personalized learning, and I'm trying to get away from that because it's kind of like those gift shops that you go to where they have like 5,000 things you can pick from, and you can get like my name and picture on a mouse pad and give it to me, you know, personalized that way. But if I'm like, I don't need a mouse pad, you know, then it's not really individualized to who I am as a person. So um, uh, you will see these terms, especially personalized, thrown around in the whole gamification realm. And I'm trying to get away from that um, just because of the problematic, uh, especially since the this overused buzzword nowadays more than anything else. So we've been talking about Twine. I've been throwing out a lot of the terms to you. This is a, a page with many resources on Twine. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to go into all of these now. Uh, Twine itself is at twinery.org, and then if you, it gives you the basics there. If you go to twinery.org slash two, that's where the actual, there's an online working environment where you can just start programming there. You don't have to have an account. You don't have to do anything else. You can just start up right there. We'll go to that in a minute. I'll show you what it's like. The problem with that is, just please remember this, is that it is storing your work in your browser cache. Okay, you can download it and save it to your computer, but if you don't do that and you clear your cache or you go to another computer, it won't be there. So just, that's the only problem with this, okay? And that's a big problem. So uh, and they're aware of that. I think they're working on some kind of solution. But the best solution is once you've worked on something, remember to download it, okay? I'm gonna show you some stuff, so just always remember to download it. Um, some uh, friends of mine at the University of Oklahoma have been experimenting with using Twine in their classes. Uh, they have this uh, experience play. It's a good place where it gives you step-by-step -step, uh, instructions on how to do some basics in Twine, how to add links, how to add graphics, those kind of things. Um, and then there's actually a tutorial that they built in Twine about how to make things in Twine, believe it or not. Uh, that's the next one. The, the problem with Twine also, they have to host the file that you create somewhere, right? Uh, it's hard for people to just go into your browser cache, you know, somewhere else in the world and act as they can't really. So there's also this uh, next one, Philomy. I don't know how you say it, but that's a good place where you can actually host your Twine files if you need one. We also have a resource here at UTA that I'll touch on in a minute where you can also host them as well. 
And then this last one is, uh, I just found out this one today, and these are some student, talk about student created examples. Someone has been doing that in their classroom. This last one's a teacher who has been having their students create some things entwined and some of the things they've created as that last example. Okay, so this is what twine looks like when you build something. This is that first one. This is the spaceship landed in my uh, backyard. This is what it looks like. Okay. Um, there's the front page. It's a normal day. The spaceship lands. You can go look or you can run away. Uh, if you run away, the stormtroopers chase you. <laughs> uh, if they and they knock you out, then you go to hyperspace. You know, there's a, these are just some of your different options that you can go through. If you notice, this probably looks like storyboarding in some ways. Yeah, very similar. This is kind of the basic ideas, and some people even recommend you kind of maybe draw out your idea that you want to put in this on a piece of paper and start mapping out some of the basics. Um, this is what the presentation looked like. There was a loop in here, right here. It forced you to stay right here until you finally uh, ask themselves, remember, and then it uh, puts them out to here, uh, to this one. And then kind of different options depending on what different people chose. And then the end of the presentation, which I never got to because I put too much stuff in here. But that happens in presentations. And this was the help center that we did. You saw this one had a lot uh, more options for people to click on. So uh, there's just a lot more arrows there. Uh, the chat bot is oh, right there. And then uh, there's actually all the, several of these leads right here. There's actually, I put an email form in there for people to email me if they didn't get an answer within their help bot. Uh, just, uh, just FYI. You know, don't want to leave them hanging if, if, they're, if you don't give them the answers for that. So let's actually try this out. Once you go to twinery.org slash two, this is what you see. Um, you have no story saved in Twine, but you actually go over here to where it says add story. Okay. So, I think we have time for this. Um, you know those games you play where one person starts saying a sentence and another person picks it up and another person picks it up? I thought we should try to create a story that way in Twine. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, I need some brave volunteers to jump in here to start adding some parts. So, who wants to go first about just throwing out a topic that we'll start off with? We can obviously go different directions. but. Anyone, any any topic that's on your mind, maybe not politics or religion. We don't apply with each other here. But. <laughs> not in your country. Oh, <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> I mean, that, that we could do that one, but we probably don't want to start fighting about that one. <laughs> hot summer day. Yeah, hot summer day. Okay, hot summer day. We'll do that one. I like that one. I just don't want to start with a big fight. You know, I don't know oh, where it wants to end. <laughs> We're recording this, you know, for, uh, <laughs> for people to come back and watch later, so. Okay, so you add a story, and then it basically opens up like this. Uh, I just want to show you the home. If you were to look at mine on my computer over there, you see about 20 of these little squares uh, showing you different stories. Uh, but we have one now, so it's a hot story, and they give you your one place to start, okay? So this is your... Uh, Double click on it, and this is where you actually start um, building your story. So, it was a hot summer day. Okay. Hot summer day. Okay, so, well, what would you call it? What would you call it? So, let's give them some options here. <laughs> Sultry afternoon. <laughs> Sultry afternoon. Or what else could they call it? Stinky, sweaty afternoon. Walking into a volcano. <laughs> <and> <laughs> dehydrated. Stinky, Walking into a volcano. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, true. I don't want to get Houston people mad at me, though. I uh, was a stinky, sweaty, uh, stinky, sweaty, miserable day, or whatever it was. Okay, so you notice I'm putting these um, brackets 
uh, what do we call those, around the term there. Those will actually become your links. Uh, let's see. Let's call this the welcome page. I just love typing on a new keyboard. Let's see. Or new to me. Okay. So, you notice we have some stuff added for us here. Huh? You start adding the options, it automatically adds pages for each of them for you. Very helpful in that, in that way for you. You now have options for the sultry afternoon, walking into a volcano, or stinky, sweaty, miserable day. So, you press the play button to see what it looks like, and this is kind of, uh, this is the basic template, is what they give you on this one. It was a hot summer day, or what would you call it? And then you, your learners are now choosing this, say, walking into a volcano. We haven't added anything to it yet there, but this is where you could add some options. What happens when you double click it? Oh, sorry, that's, um, I'm going up there. That's one of the kind of little bugs of it. Double clicking is supposed to be for when you are in this view, but because you haven't double clicked it yet and put anything there, it's still putting that in the preview. Okay. So now, how do you know? Like, are there other things you're going to have to use besides the two little mm -hmm. brackets? Or mm -hmm. is there a sheet? Is there some way to have that code? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> in the resources, there is a link to the uh, Twine tutorials, mm -hmm. and it goes through some of the different options you have there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also that experience play link that I gave you takes you step by step through things like adding links uh, to external websites, adding images, changing the background color, those kind of things. There's you have to get a little code. Okay. Um, so if I clicked on walking into a volcano, that's it says there, double click, it's just showing you what's already there, the default there. So if I wanted to put, um, let's see. Let's actually find a good volcano picture. All right, so you are walking into a volcano. So I could come over here and uh, if you know any HTML code, HTML code works in here. You just enter it in there. But, or if you don't, you can always look it up somewhere. That's expensive. So let's see. Oh, you know what? Let's see. Let's stop playing for me now. Well, so anyway, so I put the image in there, and if you choose walk into a volcano, then students would get this image of a volcano. Or maybe you can find a GIF out there of someone actually walking into a volcano. That would be interesting. And so what you're saying is we got to learn a little bit of HTML first, or we got to, somehow we're going to have to know, because I wouldn't have known. Well, you don't necessarily have to know that. Uh, that was just an uh, extra point that I put in there. But. So when you put in the picture, you did some HTML, oh, well, yeah. and you just click cut and paste the link, or, or pick, I mean, how do you, how'd you do that? Uh, that was because I just knew HTML. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that, I see what you're saying now. Okay, yeah, sorry. It, it does help to know some HTML for stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So I would I would need to use the code on all of those. That's if you want I'm to, saying. yeah. Okay. You could also so just, basically we're coding the whole thing. It's not really just a... There are some code to it. If you just want to keep it completely text-based, you could just come over here and put text on this, and would, the students can see the text. Oh, no, that's <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> it just depends on what you want to do. If you go to uh, like stock image sites, uh, stock photography, stuff like that, they will have that. Yeah. You can go to uh, uh, um, Unsplash and those other kind of websites, and they will give you the actual HTML code that you just copy and paste in there, and it'll work. Yeah. That's a good There's question. There's actually a website that will convert it to HTML code for you. It's HTML code, and you can copy Copy an edition, it will convert it to code oh. register. You can copy it that in. Um, or like, I've been using it with Canvas, which you can do it because I can't get my tables and things. So I'm not sure if it's a real <laughs> so you can copy in something from Word into there. It'll convert it all. I'
Okay. Okay. No, I like that one. Yeah, that's that's why I like everyone contributing because I did not know about this. It's a great site. So it was so. Uh, <laughs> so if I went and put that, you know, text in there, it's now replaced that with the text in there. So. We lost the screen on all. Oh, you did. Sharing. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do? Just put under the sharing in the middle. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Everyone online. And so I'd like to miss it here. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so we can you know come here and say it's uh, it was so hot, you know. So what do what do you do? What would people do if it's too hot? Jump in a swimming pool. Jump in a swimming pool. All right. Spell correctly. Another option. Run through a sprinkler. Run through a sprinkler. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Eat an icy head in a freezer. <laughs> and so on. And so we see from, so we did that. We have three more options added. So as you go along, it just automatically adds your options to it. And that's a very helpful feature. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now, see, we go to the volcano. They see their picture of the volcano. There's always a back button here. Very helpful. Or they go sultry afternoon. They see it's so hot. What can you do? Jump in a swimming pool, run through a sprinkler, head in the freezer. And then, you know, you still have the stock. So, this is kind of the basic idea of how this works. The question here. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you link the uh, volcano to the swimming pool? Yes. Could you link it? Separate. Yeah. Did I kill the screen sharing again, Justin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've now figured out what I'm doing wrong. Okay. Um, okay. Let's drag this down a little bit away from that. Okay. So you want to link the swimming pool to the. I wanted to link the volcano to make the swimming pool option off of that. Off of that, okay. The same, yeah, that same one. Yeah, so if you actually <laughs> put the same link, just copy that one, and then put the same link there with the same title, see it creates a little arrow there. It'll know that it created, connected there. And if I wanted a second jump in the swimming pool, I'd have to name it something slightly different. Yeah. And this, uh, there we go. Okay. So now when you go to Walk the Volcano, you have the jump in the swimming pool option there as well as uh, Sultry Afternoon has it there as well. So, yeah, that's one of the ways you can create lots of different options is uh, jumping back and forth to different places. And you already created it and say they need to, you know, the students that already knew a certain topic, they skip right to it to, you know, the more advanced topic and the students who need to learn uh, more about it because they were not hooked on phonics. Uh, then let's put them through these two or three options before they get there and then they leave there. So, yeah. Uh, any way that you can think of branching pathways and mazes and all those kind of things, you can work out here. So, so if you put this into your class for students, how do you know, is there a way to link it so that you know that they're using it or they are using it, what they've done in it, or how? how Not currently that? right now. You'd have to ask them some kind of question or quiz. Um, have them print something that shows something out, yeah. Something embedded in it that, you, that would say, Send me a notice that you've read this page. Yeah, there's a, let me go to this one. Um, 
we had actually, oh, sorry, I'll go for here. If they didn't find the answer in the chat bot, we put in a form in there. If you want to get into coding an HTML form, that will send an email to you. Um, I even have a soft code for this I can send it to if you want to play around with it. Um, or you can also um, go to like a, the, make an HTML website and put an email address in there, hopefully, and it'll give you a mail to email address, and then you click on that, and it'll bring up their email, and they can send, send something to you. Um, and there are, if you really want to get into advanced coding, this is open source, uh, so you can dig into the code and see if you can connect it. Uh, it, it will send variables out. Uh, if you can create something that will collect those variables. But um, that's, that, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> that's beyond what I know, so that, that is possible. Matt, <laughs> can you insert a link on Twine to a web page where they will do something interactive on the web page mm -hmm. as a result of that, and then it'll take them back to a different pathway? If you can control that web page that you go to, um, or if you know HTML coding and you want to do an iframe, if you're familiar with those, you, you can put iframes. Okay. Yeah, the, um, let me pull this up. That, this uh, chatbot is actually on a separate page somewhere else uh, because uh, Twine would not take the code that they gave me for the chatbot, so I just created a separate HTML page, put the chatbot code in there, embedded it within Twine and, and an iframe, if you're familiar with those. So uh, that would probably be another way to do if you want to put the, put the code in the iframe. Um, oh, and something else to show you, too, if you find, where was it? Let's see. So this is an animated GIF right here, if you're wondering how that is. I just found an image that was an animated GIF right there. Um, let's see. That's an animated GIF too. Uh, so if you run away from the stormtroopers, you can embed YouTube videos in here. Just use our YouTube embed code. And so I said that you get zapped uh, like Princess Leia did. You try to run away. So that's like, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then you wake up in your hyperspace, right? So um, other websites that give you some kind of embed code, whether it's for pictures, for videos, for other things, they'll accept that in Twine as well. So, um, you know, you 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 know, you've created a lot of videos, right, and content. You can give them the option to choose between four different videos. They click on it, and then that page of that video comes up for them. Yeah, you know, different kind of options like that. Oh, sorry. How you would save this so that you can? Ah, good question. So now that we have created our, uh, where did that go? We've created our hot summer day, and we want to save this, or just at least we want to work on it again and make sure that we've got a copy, or we want to download it so that we can then upload it to Canvas or some other place. Um, what you do? Publish the file right there. That option. It will save you a file. And let's see. Those are downloads. Hot summer day right there. So this is now a standalone HTML file. It will work anywhere you put it that can host HTML files all on its own, no other code needed, to do exactly what we had just programmed it to do. So if I were to, you could then send this file to someone else, they could just open it from their desktop and it'll work. Okay, so when you published to a file, it just went to your downloads? Yeah. Now, if you want your students to see it online somewhere, you would then need to upload it somewhere else. To website, to Canvas, to the hosting service I showed you earlier, whatnot. Also, if you change computers, you can take that file and import it. There's an import function if you see it right over here. Import from file, you can take that file, you just download it, import it to another computer, another browser somewhere, and then start editing it again if you want to. Just remember to download it again or else you're going to lose your edits. So. What if you saved it like in um, a cloud base? then you could do it from any Dropbox or something like that. Could you, yeah. if you saved it there, then could you work on it from any computer? Uh, yeah, you probably want to um, 
download to that computer and then upload it into the Twine uh, website. But yeah. And you could also uh, host it from there probably as well, like Dropbox, as long as you made the link was available to anyone who had it kind of thing. That's a good question. And you also see they start uh, changing your little uh, symbol there so you can um, see how complex your story is as well. Let's see. Okay, so um, you know, I kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, you can also consider letting your students do things in Twine as well. Uh, Twine in place of the report as a portfolio, or even have them create your course content in Twine to help them understand complex relationships. Or for you, maybe they, they create something in Twine, send it to you, you look at it to see how they understood the complex relationships within this topic that we're uh, studying. There was, and there was a link earlier on one of the slides. You can go uh, look at some of the student work as well that have, they've done in other classes. Uh, hold on. This was also the experiment where someone had put um, Twine into Canvas. The actual Twine editor itself, not just a final Twine file, but they had put the Twine editor in Canvas so this, any student that clicked on this would have Twine right there. Uh, obviously, with Canvas, you can also just put Twine in there in the iframe function as well. The, the twinery.org slash two would go in there as well. This was, he was trying to experiment to see if he could find a way to then get this to automatically go to the uh, gradebook, which is, I think, one of else's questions is, you know, how can they submit it to us? They're still working on that, but no one's worked it out perfectly yet. Hopefully, someday, because, you know, Canvas does have LTIs and other things that hopefully will. So I'll take that, we'll see. Um, and then, let's see. Also to point out that we're looking at one tool here called Twine that um, does have certain capabilities for creating nonlinear content. There are other tools and other ways to do this. Um, if you do know HTML coding, obviously you could just start creating a bunch of pages and put a bunch of links and put together all you want to. Maybe use Twine as your mapping tool for how you want to map that out, how it works out. There are other ways to do that. Also in Canvas, there is a tool called Mastery Paths. Has anyone used Mastery Paths? And it works with ours? Or do you know? Yeah, I used it in Canvas. It's okay. Very, I mean, it was like really simple. Yeah. I mean, like what I did was just like. You can't yeah. do this one until you get to the next one, and you can't do. Yeah. You have to finish all these. I haven't gone very far in depth. Yeah. Like you could do similar stuff to the Twine with that uh, in Canvas. The the one caveat with Canvas is that it's all based on the grades, so you have to situate, uh, I believe, assessments and stuff in there to see which student goes where. I believe mm -hmm. based on how they score. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> which uh, bless you. <laughs> yeah. Which you know with my kind of. Uh, it set the wrong tone for what you're trying to do if you're trying to have some kind of exploratory concept. It just depends, you know, on what you're trying to do. It's not necessarily bad, but I did put a link to the documentation on how you do that in Canvas in there if you want to explore that as well. Just know that tools in there. There, there are cases where you might actually want some situated uh, assessments and grades within this branching concept, and, the, and Twine doesn't offer that. Um, I guess you can find a way to do that because they, do, they can keep scores and things, but it's kind of advanced coding. Canvas has an option to do that that's uh, kind of more intuitive, and it is a tool that we have. So just wanted to throw that out as an option. Uh, I showed you the chatbot earlier. Uh, those chatbots can also do some nonlinear type of content. The tool that I specifically use is the SAP Conversational AI chatbot. It is a, a service you have to sign up for it, but you can use it for free. Um, and it does have some I don't know, mid-level coding that you kind of have to do to set up some chatbots, but I don't know chatbots at all, and I did figure it out. So uh, if it's something you want to give, a, give a, a try, that is one that I would possibly recommend. There are things in there where it, uh, you can also they can, you, it can ask learners a question, say, you know, what city are you coming from? And then they enter their city, and then they start getting responses based on the city that they're in, right? So if you have students from different parts of the world or whatever, and you want to maybe give them different responses depending on where they live or any other factor like that. In a kind of conversational way, there are ways to do that with chatbots. Um, that's a bit more advanced, but um, 
I did want to throw that out there if you want to dig into that. And we are starting to do some uh, study in the fall. I know Peggy's part of it as well. Uh, we're going to actually start putting some chatbots into some courses here at UTA and see what students think about it. Um, it's basically frequently asked questions about the, you know, the, the course content, you know, how do I get grades? What if I'm late on this? Those kind of things. The chat will hopefully answer it. But um, we'd like to take it in a more advanced stage in the near future uh, to where instead of it's just in a chat bot, it might actually be the content itself. And the content itself would ask a question. And then depending on their background or depending on where they're at, uh, depending on their, you know, what they've, their past knowledge, it would maybe give them different content and activities depending on what they type into it. So if any of you are interested in that, I did want to throw that out there because um, that's a study that we're moving forward with and we're always interested in getting more people on that one. Uh, let's see, a couple of more, um, that's a little bit of a typo, I'll fix that one. Okay, uh, some other helpful tools for looking at nonlinear content. Uh, there's a concept called, um, just ignore this part after that. I don't know why that got pasted up there. <laughs> it should just be down there, but the assignment banks. Um, we've experimented with that. Justin's experimented with that a little bit, I know. Uh, it's kind of a concept of micro-learning, uh, micro-content. Uh, where learners, instead of you telling them the one assignment they do, you start giving them different options for how they could do their assignment. Uh, if they want to do a paper or a video or a one act play or a claymation sculpture or something, you kind of give them the options to choose different ways to prove to you that they learned what they learned. And so um, when looking at the different pathways, as you kind of get to, you plan different pathways for different people with different phonics levels or different things like that, you may get to the end and decide, well, different learners may need to do different things to prove to me that they learned what they learned. So how can I give them these options? One of these options is an assignment bank where you give several different, it's a bank of options and they choose from it. Um, and you know, you, and it can be a few options, it can be a lot of options. Uh, there's actually some tools out there where you can build these in WordPress and other tools. And if, if you're interested in that, you can talk to me or Justin and we can tell you some more about that one. Um, and a lot of this can be hosted in the UTA cloud. A future session of, of these offerings, we're gonna go into the UTA cloud, but it's a service uh, this is the website, uta.cloud. You can go there, uh, sign in with the UTA username and password, and get uh, some free web cloud hosting. And it also has a lot of one-touch uh, one installation tools. You can get WordPress, Omeka, 100 different open source tools uh, at your fingertips. Press button, install, and go. A couple of people here using it. Uh, Alex, Peggy, you've used it. Yeah, Peggy, you yeah. used it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For them. Did you like it? or? I love it. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> I was going to ask that first before. <laughs> but uh, your students can use it as well. You can use it. Uh, and it's a, it's a free tool for UJ uh, students, staff, and faculty. Uh, also, the concept of micro content assessments. We've touched on that a lot. Peggy's done a lot of work on that. <laughs> um, we should probably get a future session on that. Uh, yeah. But if you're going to start offering these different options, you're probably going to have to look into how can I get a smaller piece of uh, uh, learning objects, a smaller piece of content, a smaller assignment to fit in with these different pathways in different places as well. So uh, you don't necessarily overwhelm yourself with creating a whole lot of content or overwhelm your students with uh, a whole lot of text. Um, any other tools or ideas you think might help out with this? Ideas? I'd like to pause when I've been talking. You can write about this on your blog. <laughs> uh, not this Just specific tool. topic. Oh, Which tool? Um, a little bit, yeah. Oh, okay. But if you go to the experience play link I gave you, it gives a lot more uh, better stuff on that, yeah. Um, and then also. Um, the other sessions that we do are going through a book that several of us worked on, including Peggy and Justin and uh, several other people at UTA, called Creating Online Learning Experiences. It's a free um, uh, open resource through UTA Pressbooks. It's, um, uh, there's not a lot of this stuff is in there, but uh, a lot of the other stuff that we're talking about is in there, so I want to throw out a plug for that while we're there. And the last concept, we did talk about self-map learning pathways a little bit at the beginning. This is a concept that Jess and I, uh, along with um, 
um, Kim Brewer and a few others have been working on. Um, we're running out of time here, but um, this is an idea where um, we'd be glad to talk with you about it. This is a, a kind of more advanced way of looking at nonlinear content. Basically what this does is you look at, uh, when you have diverse learners in your course, some will want to follow you as the instructor because they're new to the topic, and some will want to go off on their own because they might be a little bit more knowledgeable or they have a different context than where you come from. This is a way to situate both of those options into a course, uh, following you as the instructor or being student-centered and then allowing learners to choose which one they do. And then they can mix the two or jump back and forth as they need to. Um, that's kind of the basic idea. We've been working on some models uh, for doing that and some ways to do that. I know Justin has done a lot of that in courses here at UTA. Um, anything you'd like to share about your experience? With that? I'll say one thing is students tend to prefer the prescribed pathway that you give them because it's what they know oftentimes, right? It's kind of scary to try new and different things, but those that do venture off into that find it really rewarding oftentimes. It's going to be a very enriching experience for them. Um, I've had students that have come forward and based on their backgrounds, I was talking about it earlier about, you know, students that had a, an advertising background and I offered them a, a different way of being able to do a kind of assignment and they just like, they poured probably 20 hours into that project because it was just something that was, that helped them connect to the course, they felt excited about it and it was amazing. It was like, can I please use this artifact going forward? And uh, anyway, yeah, so like I said, they, they tend to gravitate towards that one right now. I think Kim would back me up with, with that one online, but, yeah. um, but it, you know, for those that really want to venture out there, it's, it's pretty rewarding stuff. So, yeah. Keep it that way. Talk to me more if you want to learn more. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably have to put a session about this together in the future. Yeah. This is, uh, we've been looking at ways to kind of define pathways and options for students to take. This is kind of a way to open it up for them to create their own pathways. Uh, with the backing of your pathway if they get lost or need help and they can always go back to that so um, Sorry to kind of throw a, uh, a You know deeper topic out there or a more complex topic out there at the very end but um, So that's basically the different ideas of nonlinear pathways. I wanted to go through uh, We have about four minutes if there are any questions back on anything we've covered so far We had a lot of good questions along the way so Make sure we got to all of them. Sorry. No, um, <laughs> I guess for me, it looks a little complex to me. You know, I'm more of a like a thing link kind of person, you know, where I need it right there. You know, you put it here and there. Um, is it is it as difficult as it seems with using HTML and stuff like that? I mean, is there really like a piece of paper that you can out and it says if you want to add something put this here if you want to yeah the, the uh, one tutorial that I gave you does give some HTML and you can kind of copy and paste okay because I'd really like to try it I think yeah. it's, it's hugely beneficial but I am a little bit intimidated by that Maybe I'll, I'll just to each other. this is yeah. interesting because we just send a users group uh, what's that let me like a users group yeah, people that are interested in trying to get all kind of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. And the thing is, when you, you go to Twine, and try whatever you want to. It's not you're not gonna yeah. kill anybody's puppy by you know trying it out. Free experiment, you know, free experiment all you want to on there and see how you can break it. Got it. Yeah, I'm good at that. Yeah. So. And someone had mentioned the website, I wanted to figure out what that website was earlier where you can uh, convert anything into HTML. I think that would be a great tool. You go like, oh, I found this image I want to use and just go to that website, copy, paste, and bring it back over, so. Yeah, yeah. Or if you set up a Teams group, there's some of us on it a lot. Yeah, I'm getting on there. I'm trying. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> so With, I have a question about this self-map learning pathway because you, you've been doing this with online classes. Mm -hmm. Like in my head, I'm thinking like in class, it's just people not showing up, mm -hmm. right? They're not coming to class. They're they're not they're doing it on their own. Yeah. So how do you how do you? I'm just uh, <laughs> it depends on like the way that you're structuring your course. I mean, there might be yeah. times that you provide more flexibility for them to you know separate every course. Maybe one day a week that they have the opportunity to do something. Or, Sorry, we were just or, talking about that. Just depends. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think about it because my, my 
classes, you know, it's one day a week, three hours. That's the biggest complaint I get anyway is that it's forever. I'm like, I can't do anything about that. Um, so I'm like, if I, cause I, I like, I like this idea because I do have students in there that are like, well, I already did some of this in like mm -hmm. AP art history and in high school. I already know this stuff and I want to help them, mm -hmm. you know, get the most out of the class instead of sitting there for three hours with me. Um, right. So kind of an interesting thing, I think, online versus uh, in, in class. How fun is out. your uh, uh, classroom space that you have? Can I check my ground? Or? Yeah, stadium team space. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, you know, I, I did take a course back in my undergrad days where the teacher basically said, okay, is anyone want to do something different and someone raised their hand and said, I want to do this. I said, okay, everyone that's interested in doing that, go with her. And then someone else raised their hand, anyone interested in that, go sit with them. And we had to move around to the chairs around that person. And I guess you could also say that, hey, my lecture is recorded and it's playing on Canvas and you know, if you want to follow that, you can sit over here and watch this TV or something, I don't know. And then maybe do some organically uh, on the spot, spontaneous group formations right there. And have different students. And if one student wants to do something all by themselves because they're the you know gothic owner type, <laughs> <laughs> that's all of us are kids. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was me definitely. But you know, I was I was the kid off of the corner reading you choose your own adventure books. But um, you could do that, you know, as well. Maybe it just depends on on how much noise and chaos you are comfortable with having in your classroom. So I'm thinking I was having always, something to to try maybe for. One subject matter and just yeah. dip my toes in. Yeah. I taught eighth grade science before I came to UTA at one point, so I'm used to noise and chaos. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you're not, you might want to you know, think about that. But yeah. and, and it's a big class too, so it's like yeah. that would be a lot of noise and chaos. Yeah. So, but I might be able to maybe look at getting another room or something that shared space. Or something. Okay. Interesting. You could you could potentially use something like this, like on Canvas or Blackboard, where they do a little bit of self discovery first to see how ready they are for the topic of the day, and if they're you know I went this direction, then they show up at class on time, and you're going to do all the intro stuff with them. And if they went this direction, then they have an assignment they're working on for the first hour and a half of class. You take a break halfway through, and when you come back. The entire class is there because the students who didn't need your lecture for the first hour came in, but they had something they were working on kind of on their own before they came. I do that sometimes with my grads and undergrads because my undergrads need a lot more, <laughs> right? But I don't want to leave my grad students out in the cold, so they kind of group together and they do something together that's more self directed while I work with the undergrads. I haven't tried doing that as like a, like I could imagine setting up a twine on Canvas so that they figure out where they are and at the end it's yeah. come to class at 5.30 or do this and then yeah. come to class at 7. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good idea. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, everything, everything we're talking about today, I'm kind of talking about kind of the you know, 100% buy in place, but wherever you're at, if you need to dip your toes in, you need to go 20%, take this idea, that idea, mix and match. You know, I'm not trying to prescribe one way for everyone to do nonlinear pathways. So it's just whatever you want to mix and match with your specific course will probably work great. So, and then I, in my class for discussion boards, they create a digital artifact, and I think I've shared this before, but they have choices um, easy, there's four levels, easy. I, I forgot what the middle one was, um, advanced, and then extreme. So maybe you put this under extreme. <laughs> and then there are students who will want to try it. And then as you dip your toe in it, so that's what I do. I have it on a Google Doc, and then they pick their digital artifact. And easy is like find a link on the internet. For some students, that's where they're at. And then others are like making their own webinars and recording them and putting them on YouTube and stuff. Like the idea of extreme, yeah. Yeah, extreme. <laughs> extreme. extreme well, what do you do, though, Peggy, with the students who are so clearly not ready for extreme, but they, they want to try it anyway? No. Yeah. Then you become a load. Or you can say, I'm not tech support. Uh, let's take the down notch. Yeah, it's tutorial. Let's go from DEF CON 5 to DEF CON 4. Tutorials on the Google Doc. 